the statistic is 87% of real estate agents are out of the business within the first five years. Wow. Because it's not easy. Yeah. I mean, I think, it, and it is the, the money equation too, that you're kind of, you know, eating what you catch. Yeah. Hey everyone, my name is Ethan DeLeon and I'm here with our founder and CEO of Small Nation, Jason Duff. Joining us on the show today, we have realtor and team lead at the Hirsch Group, Andrew Hirsch. We want to welcome you to the Small Nation podcast where we share some of the valuable lessons with what we have learned about entrepreneurship, real estate, economic development, and more. The point of this podcast is to create value for you, the listener, and to create a space to learn, talk about what's trending, and inspire others. Thank you, Ethan. Welcome, Andrew. How's it going, guys? We've got the Andrew Hirsch here in the studio All today. All right. No, it, it's really great to see you, Andrew. Um, you know, Andrew and I uh, went to high school together, uh, so he's a few years younger than me. But we, many of uh, our, our mutual friends, uh, we grew up in the the big area of Huntsville, right? We, we did. You were the Bell. You were the Bell Center, though. Uh, Bell Edition. Bell Edition. At Bell Edition Subdivision. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I grew up in the the village of Huntsville, and uh, you know, our people would go toilet paper their people. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, unfortunately, that is true. That is true. I did venture into the uh, village of Huntsville and, and got some of our friends as well. There yeah. you go. You know, it, you kids aren't toilet papering anymore. What's what's up with that? You know, that's so funny. So I was actually on a listing appointment in West Liberty. So I sell real estate in Columbus mainly. I still venture out, still service Bell Fountain in the surrounding areas was on a listing appointment in West Liberty. When I was leaving West Liberty, there was a house that had toilet paper and I just started laughing. And I'm like, yeah. nobody does that in Columbus, especially there. Um, but they're missing here. out on small town fun. That's what I say. And the and kids harmless, these days need, harmless fun. <laughs> need to have small town fun. Well, uh, on that note, uh, you're working in real estate today, you mentioned. I am. If you call it work. <laughs> well, that's a good sign. That means you love what you do? Absolutely. Okay. Well, tell us, how did you get started in real estate? So real estate um, has been a huge blessing to me and my family and myself personally. I got licensed in December of 2014, which seems like an eternity ago. Mm -hmm. But I was graduated college. I had some inside sales job. I had an outside sales job, which you know, that was the goal of, you know, when I was inside sales, I was never at my desk. And because I was always building relationships with everybody else in the office, which they're like, why aren't you sitting at your desk <laughs> calling on that phone? And you're yeah. like the little butterfly that's out and about hundred percent. I would, <laughs> okay. I would do yeah. my work and I would get everything done, but I would always, that's just who I am of, you know, learning about others and picking their brain. So I was always at everybody else's cubicle while I was in the office. And my manager would always be like, get back at your desk. <laughs> um, so naturally then, you know, transitioned into a, you know, a different role at a different company outside sales, got me to Columbus. And then I really wasn't in that job for that long and, and kind of ran into a family friend, Tammy Oakley. She's a realtor in Marysville. And I just chewed her ear off for like two and a half hours at a family cookout, just picked her brain <laughs> about real estate. And she said, Hey, if you ever decide to get your classes, you know, and start that, let me know. I can, you know, get you in contact with our office manager in Columbus and have that conversation. Well, I never told her and called her like three months later and said, Hey, Tammy, I got one class left next week and I need to take my test. You surprised her. <laughs> so I surprised her, oh, wow. you know, and then just literally stepped full go into real estate. Didn't have any other job, which, you know, not everybody is able to do that. So I was very fortunate so the real estate company probably just paid you this massive salary to start, right? <laughs> That's how it works. Un unfortunately, uh, and... we are 100% commission. So <laughs> yeah. I actually yeah. didn't get a paycheck for four and a half months in my real estate career, which, you know, is, uh, is hard. But I think it, you know, I never forget that first year, uh, how much money I made, um, which was not much at all. You know, I, that always drives me, you know, why I show up at the office every day and really enjoy because it's not about the money. It's about the people, but I was able to help, you know, six families and build those relationships that are still today and continue to do that more and more. Okay. So you went to, to college at was the BG. Is that mm -hmm. right? Okay. Bowling Green. Uh, what'd you study there? So I just studied business communications, business communication that um, led to sales. Yeah. Okay. So I, I, I knew I needed a degree at that time in life. You know, I think things are a little bit different now, depending yeah. on what kids want to do, you know, leaving high school and with the trade, you know, schools out of, 
you know, while they're in high school and, and with all the entrepreneurism, I mean, somebody can pick up something and have a career, you know, right out of high school without a college education. You know, when we grew up, I think it was more kind of mainstream to get that, you know, college degree, which I knew I needed. Mm -hmm. I got that and then went into sales and just, I always knew my personality would, (laughs) would lead me to the way. (laughs) Yeah. Mm -hmm. So after you got started, you said, you know, first four months, you know, it's kind of a learning curve, you know, just waiting for that first deal to come through. And we've shared some of Jason's experience in the past. Uh, you know, I was a terrible realtor <laughs> <laughs> and I've mentioned this on the, the podcast before, but like the time that I started, it was really when 2005, 2006, when the economic crisis hit and the phone was not ringing mm-hmm. and there weren't, uh, there weren't a lot of opportunities of, of buyers that were looking. So I, I remember, like you said, in the beginning, like you, you, what you caught is what you ate. Like, mm-hmm. and so you had to be creative and be different and, and have some drive and hustle. And then I spent a lot of time listening to others. Similar story or different? Like when you, when you got started? Yeah. So, you know, 2014, you know, the, the economy is starting to come back, you know, naturally. And I was in Columbus, which I think is a little bit different market than, you know, here in Logan County where there's just more happening. However, you know, things were just coming back, you know, people were starting to get more comfortable and, you know, everyone was doing a little bit better. I chose to go to an office that was very experienced, had probably 125 agents, probably had eight to 10 teams in the office of agents that have been around for 30 years. And I was always a advocate of, you know, they've been through the economic crisis. They've been through different markets up and down. So that's who I want to sit around. That's who I want to talk to. I want to hear their acumen, what they're talking about, the things that they're doing on a daily basis, because they know what it's like. And they've been a staple in, you know, the industry. So I was just, I was in there every day. And and somebody told me probably the first two months, if you want to be successful in real estate, you'll show up at the office every day. Didn't mean I had to be there for eight hours. Mm -hmm. And I always tell, I tell this story to everybody, especially new agents. And I took it to heart. I literally was at the office every single day, you know, Monday through Friday, not all day long, right? but I was in there for at least an hour, two hours. You know, some days I'd be in there for seven hours and you would just pick up on things, but then you pick up on more opportunities and you're like, man, I've been here for three months and you're out showing a client and you're a new realtor and they ask a question and you're like, I've never been in this situation, but man, I remember at the office, those experienced agents talking about that. Yeah. So now you sound more experienced as an individual and you just gain that experience from being around other experienced and successful agents to, to what you said, you know, the phone wasn't ringing for me as a new agent. I mean, I think that's just natural for all new agents because somebody's going to make the biggest purchase of their life are they going to call an agent that's been licensed for three weeks? <laughs> yeah. That's the thing is the inexperience and even looking young and being youthful to some people translates as a big negative. Oh, that's funny. You say that because when Are I you was right a, out of like high school, what, like, you yeah. know, that's, that's what yeah, they that's, believe. Like, it's so funny. Cause when I was a new agent, I didn't have a beard. Mm-hmm. I was clean shaven and I would, <laughs> and I would meet cause I would do open houses every weekend because that is a free opportunity to get in front of, clients, potential clients. Yeah. And I would have, you know, people come through the open houses and they're in their mid forties, early fifties. And they're looking at me like, has this dude even bought a house? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. like, am I going to yeah. call him? <laughs> yeah. So there is that battle that you're facing as a younger agent. Uh, it's just naturally more difficult to gain the trust of someone. How, how did you overcome that? With knowledge. And, and you would try to try to spit knowledge out when you're at the open house to make them think like, okay, this guy knows what he's talking about. He's pointing out, Hey, make sure we're looking at this. Make sure we're looking at that. Hey, in the foundation, we're going to look at that. We're going to look at the furnace. We're going to look, Hey, when I'm outside, I'm looking at the roof lines. I'm looking at the soffits, making sure there's no rotting. And then they're, they're hearing these details of, okay, this guy, he knows what he's talking yeah. about. You weren't just pushing business cards you were there as a resource Correct. and providing advice. And you can't fake that. You had to have the humility to listen to your, you know, the people who had been there before you, right? And mm-hmm. uh, then take it to heart and put it into action, right? And it was only then that people trusted you and got started, right? 
So you're saying you got started with, you know, a group and a brokerage. Can you just, for a general breakdown, for those who don't know, can you just explain the the structure of kind of how, like what a brokerage and what a group and all that means? So, so to be a licensed realtor, you have to be sponsored by a licensed broker in the state of Ohio. Um, not sure what it is. I think it's like that in every state. Mm-hmm. So someone has to sponsor you prior to you actually taking the exam. Um, oh, wow. So again, that comes back to Tammy Oakley, you know, was that resource for me prior to me being licensed, got me connected with Caldwell Banker and they sponsored me, took the test, passed. So I came in as a individual agent. I was not on a team. So the broker is like the head broker. You're their responsibility. So if there's anything, you know, that happens in a transaction, they're kind of like your backbone. They're, they're there to support you as an agent. Yeah. They provide resources. Um, so, you know, obviously they, do take some of your commission split, but you get a lot of resources. So as a new agent, that's another thing. A lot of new agents think about, I'm going to go to the broker that gives me a 95 five split, (laughs) but has no resources. And they wonder why they can't sell a house. So I was told as a new agent, don't worry about the commission split, worry about a broker that's going to train you, give you resources to sell houses. And you found it to be worth it. hundred percent because 0% of uh, 90% is not, anything. it's not very much. <laughs> yeah. a, an so, important calculation. Yeah. So I went to the, you know, I was an individual agent. I could have joined a team. Yeah. Decided not to. Um, and then eventually 2018 hired a, an assistant, a, you know, part-time Amy Clark. And then now she's full-time. And then I brought on my first agent and then started my own team. So now I am a team within a brokerage. So I have agents on my team that I help support and give them resources, but they also have the support of the broker as well. So how do you market that? What does that look like to the customer? So we market as a, I market as a team agents on my team that helps benefit them when they're out on a listing appointment or they're talking to clients to say, Hey, you know, I have this, you don't just get me for the same, you get the Hirsch group, you get the the resources, you get the, you know, full-time transaction coordinator, you're going to be full hands on deck. You know, if I need help, yeah, we're all there to support. And that, and that's what I try to give to my team. And we do a great job. The agents on my team are unbelievable. They're unselfish. They, they don't get a benefit when someone else on the team has a transaction per se financially, Mm -hmm. but we're all there to help each other and take time out of our day. But that's when I was a new agent, And I was an an individual agent in an office. That's what everybody else did. They helped other agents that weren't on their team. They helped other individual agents. And I think it all comes around. Real estate is stressful. And the thing that most people, until you go through the transaction cycle and all the various players that you have to get on the same page, if you try to do that yourself without other people that have been through that, it can be lonely, scary, highly emotional because buyers and sellers, whether we like it or not, they're emotional beings. And the side of the business is very transactional, but you have to help people that when there's an inspection and these things come up on the inspection report and there's a contingency in the contract that says, you know, this is this whole deal is contingent on what this piece of paper says. (laughs) People can read it completely differently. And and that's the I think the value of working with a real estate professional particularly a licensed realtor, is this is not their first rodeo. And then I think what Andrew just explained, what I took away is that by being a part of a team, he has got people on there that things just don't get stuck. The Mm -hmm. ball is continuing to move down the court, using a basketball analogy there. He's a basketball player. Like, (laughs) you know, the thing about it is is, is that you've got, you're working with others to help that client. And, And really, you have a fiduciary responsibility, which that's another thing that, as a legal term, um, you, you you are bound to represent that client, which could be a buyer, could be a seller. And then in Ohio, we have this term called dual agency, which in some contracts, you can represent both. That, that is How correct. did you like that real estate law <laughs> lesson there? Like, I love it. <laughs> but a lot of people don't know that. Yeah. You know, they're just uneducated. But come, coming back to your point on the inspection and having, you know, and that's just one part of the transaction of, of many, but when you're representing your client and you're there as a professional to educate them, your client's going to react completely different than if I would just send a 
60 page inspection report to my client without ever talking to them, they're going to think the house is going to fall over and burn down the moment they get the keys. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As a professional, your job is to educate your client. One, when you're at the house showing it to them. And that comes back to having that real estate knowledge of walking through the house, looking at the foundation, looking at the furnace, looking at the, you know, the roof lines and having those conversations, every house you're going through, because one, you're educating them and then they're starting to understand, okay, you know, I've seen 15 houses. We've pointed this out. This has been how it looks on seven of the 15. Okay. This is normal. Whereas if you would just never even point anything out, they go into contract, they get the inspection. They see this hairline crack down a poured foundation. The house is going to fall over. Correct. Where yeah. 90% you, of those houses in that class or that price point would have that same issue. A hundred percent. You know, a builder, if it's large, I, I think, I don't know what it is, but if you go build a house, they do the poor foundation. It's like, if it's large, you know, less than three eighths of an inch, we're not even going to come out and look at it, mm -hmm. you know, but an uneducated buyer is going to look at that and go, Oh my gosh, my foundation's going to cave in. Yeah. You know, so it's all about education. So then by the time your client gets to the inspection report, you get, you know, they get that from the inspector. It's a whole different reaction. Yeah. They're calm. They're okay. You know, and people think a 60 page report is just, oh my gosh, what's wrong with the house? Yeah. I have clients that we recommend get a home inspection on a new build. Why would I do that? To protect yourself. Mm -hmm. And you'll still get a 60 page report on a new build because <laughs> no house is perfect. Yeah. That's right. And if, if they get all that with any, without any context, then it also looks bad on you, which also, I mean, reputation in real estate. Like, <laughs> But I think that's the, the thing that, that a high percentage of people in the industry don't go to the level that you have built for your practice, which has been a differentiator for you, right? Mm -hmm. So there are lots of people in, in many professions. You can think of your, your dentist. You can think of your accountant. You can think of your attorney. It's how do you find the person that you want to work with and person that's got, you know, personality-wise, but also has the skills. Like, how do you attract new business? How do you grow your business? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, now, now that I've been licensed for my goodness, eight years, you know, most of all my business is repeat and referrals. Yeah. It just, wow. you know, because I think you build that reputation and you're, and you've had now so many, you know, 300 plus transactions, you have your clients that have had great experiences with you. They've trusted you They've now had three or four transactions. You've been a resource to them. They enjoy being around you. They just trust you. You've built friend. So many of my clients are great friends. Mm -hmm. And then now, you know, they're speaking to their sphere of, hey, Steve's going to go buy a house in the next six months. Dude, you got to call my guy, Andrew. Yeah. He will take care of you, but he's also a cool guy. They have great client events and you guys will probably hang out. There you go. Outside of real right. estate, you know. People buy from people that they like. They know, like, and trust. That there too. Love that. Yeah. All right, so take me back. You're, you're hiring. Uh, you hired your first part-time, you said at the time, right? What were you looking for in your first hire? How did you feel about it? Like, have you ever hired anyone before that? <laughs> and so then I, what were you looking for on your on your team, you know? So I have. My my aunt had a small business in Columbus, Smoothie King. She was the first one in, in all of Columbus in Gahanna. I took some time off college and... Had you worked in the business for a while, right? Yeah, for yeah. about two years. Um, I was 20. Okay. And that was my first time ever hiring people. And she made, and, and it was great because she just made me go, my Aunt Laura, she's just made, she's like, no, you're going to be by yourself. You got to go interview these people. Good luck. <laughs> I'm like, oh, <laughs> great. Oh, boy. And, and it wasn't like, it was so just the, the business, the building was still being built. So like I was interviewing these people in my car. I was just, yeah. Casual about it. Yeah. So like I went through that experience a long time ago. So then when I was looking to hire someone in real estate, it's completely different though, because their job relies on me being successful, you know? Wow. Yeah. So it was a whole different mindset. You know, I had a coach at the time and it, it took me, it took me a year to hire someone because I went through the process. I interviewed people, didn't like any candidates. <laughs> and then, and then just like put it on the back. They're burner. all bad. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it just, I just put it on the back burner because I was naturally busy yeah. and that was the thing. My coach is like, but you can't get busier if you don't hire someone. 
isn't that the crux for so many people? It's like, if you're a hard worker, it's just faster if I just do it all, then try to teach it to someone else. And if they don't do it well, like why, why I, I know I talked to a lot of people that that's their barrier to getting over that. Was that something that you struggled with? Oh, it was because now, you know, never want to lose Amy because she's a huge advocate for me and my business, but What's her phone number again? Yeah. Because <laughs> I think we, everyone's looking for a name here right we now. Keep that yeah. on, we, keep, we keep that on lockdown. Um, but no, it's funny because if something happened where I had to hire someone again, mm -hmm. I wouldn't even think twice. It, it, I would probably hire too quick it, mm -hmm. is probably what would happen wow. because I understand the value of that position now that I've had it in my business for four years now and the value she provides to my teammates and team members, just it's getting over that hump. So when I brought her on in 2018, she was 15 to 20 hours. And we joke about this. I think it was the one of the busy, it was at, when I hired her as the busiest month of my career, I had 13 transactions and she was like the second day you were in, you were like, just figure it out. <laughs> Good luck. Here's the keys. Thank so you. So all that mentorship and, and like learning from others just out the door right there. It was out the door. <laughs> and then it was funny because I would, I'm such a perfectionist with things in my business and, and how things look because it's a reflection of me and that's what people are going to see. And sometimes I worry about things that I shouldn't be worrying about. And I was just always over her shoulder like, hey, this mm. is how you do this. This is how you do this. Yeah. She knows like <laughs> people will bring things to her, our, our marketing department. And she'll be like, he's not going to like that. Yeah. So, she knows. Yeah. She, she learned from you. She understands yeah. what I expect. And I think anybody in, in real estate outside of real estate owning their own business, if they have someone like that takes so much off their plate and gives them so much more room to grow and make an impact on other people's lives. For you, what was the things that were holding you back, but what were the things that you do really well and wanted to double down on that? So great, great question there. Um, Tom Ferry is a very profound real estate coach out West nationally has a podcast, has a YouTube show. And I would watch that with, you know, just picking up a lot of nuggets on how to be successful. And he says every real estate transaction has 11 hours of back end work. So wow. every transaction. Mm -hmm. So you think about it when I hired her, I think I had 43 transactions that year. So she takes 11 hours off my plate mm -hmm. per train per transaction to do it properly. All the steps from the moment you go into contract to the day you close. So now I'm not in the office doing clerical work. I'm out able to be in the field, meeting clients, being with clients, showing them houses, being more available to them to be a better resource. Yeah. It frees you up to be, to do your job better, honestly, right? Yeah. What you thought was going to hold you back you know, actually worked. <laughs> I think a lot of people forget about how much time it does take. And I think as we do a lot of work in commercial real estate, people think that we just put a sign in the window of the storefront and someone calls and then the next day they get the keys. And it is the, the prospecting. It is the, you know, maybe renovations, construction, financing, security deposit, legal agreement, you know, walkthroughs, inspections, coaching and mentorship after that. Like we at Small Nation have developed a unique process around helping tenants that are looking for spaces be successful long term. And the same thing is true, I think, of differentiating your practice at the Hirsch Group by having someone like Amy, you're on the front side of things, but those 11 hours of time of working with a team to make sure that your client actually gets from point A to point B with the least amount of time, but the, because time is money too. And so, you know, it, it sounds like you've developed a unique process working with her that, that you, that is unique to, to you and your firm too. Yeah. I mean, it's a, and even more so, I think to the new agents on my team that are new into the industry where they don't have to go through that kind of, okay, now I have my first transaction. Now I'm spending all this time on the back end instead of growing my business, they can now spend their time on our team as a new agent growing their business and spending their time and efforts on business building activities, being out into the community, being around their sphere to put them in a better position to succeed. Because a lot of people don't realize the statistic is 87% of real estate agents are out of the business within the first five years. Wow. Because it's not easy. 
Yeah. I mean, I think, it, and it is the, the money equation too, that you're kind of, you know, eating what you catch. Yeah. Everybody sees the Instagram realtor. <laughs> no, nobody sees the back. By the end. way, I think you're doing a pretty good job with your social media. So, but you're humble about it. I mean, the, the ones that aren't humble about it, you know, are driving up that fancy car and oh, throwing yeah. the hundred dollar bills. Like, yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah. I, and I like to just, you know, social media, you know, talking about social media and putting all that stuff out there, you know, the instant Instagram realtor, I don't just show real estate. Cause that's, I mean that everybody loves real estate, but it also, they don't want to see just real estate. They want to see who, who I am. And mm-hmm. people get to see that on my social, you know, my family, you know, my wife, Jessica, and my three kids, the things that I like to do that my interests and stuff like that. So I love that kind of to your point, they're going to work with who they know, right. Who they trust. Like, Oh, this guy has a family too. Like he's not, you know, out just to play the game. <laughs> the, the other thing about your market that I think people care about is they want to hire a realtor that knows the local market. What are the school districts like? Where can I get a great pizza? You know, where, uh, where are the parks that, that we can hang out in? You know, I, I do think what I look at a lot of your social media, you give shout outs to other local businesses. You're highlighting the events that are happening in your market and area. And it's all those things that are putting, you know, you're actually an economic driver with your traffic and your interest to all those things that are happening in your community. Well, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> no, I think it's great. And I, but, I, but that, that, you know, to a lot of people, that sounds like, oh, that sounds, you know, really easy to do. But there's a lot of people that don't understand how powerful of a marketing tool that is. Yeah. I, I love to support other people's businesses and especially local businesses in the community because I understand what they are going through as a entrepreneur. It's not easy. And if, you know, they're going to hear the first person that has a bad experience, but why don't we speak of the great experiences that we have and people that give us as consumers a good and great experience on our, you know, visits to them or being around them, especially in today's world where a lot of negativity is out online. Let's be positive and, and show, you know, the light on other business owners and, and builders of our communities. Yeah. And, I, you know, we've had a couple guests on in the past, I think back to Tim Shermack talking about the impact that that can have. When you highlight your local businesses or even Seth and Garrett, where they talked about, you know, how far that goes for their business, you know, by just doing that, uplifting others. Um, so a lot of it's common on our <laughs> podcast guests that talk about real estate um, that they eventually get into an investment property of their own. So I have to ask. Did you get into the game? I did. <laughs> All right. <laughs> actually, tell us about it. Actually came back home. Okay. Um, so bought a duplex here in Bell Fountain last Woo-hoo! summer. <laughs> he's this big Columbus realtor and he's spending his big investment capital in Bell Fountain, Ohio. Thank you. Love it, right? <laughs> but I, lo- I love what you you are doing in, the, in our community. And and I, I know our community. Um, it has a you know special place in my heart. You know, like everybody said, you know, Logan County will always be a part of me. And, and just because I'm 45 minutes away doesn't mean I'm not going to come back and spend my money and, and support the businesses here. But also, you know, if I can spend my money on an investment property here and it's not only putting money back in the community, but also putting a riff over someone else's head and being, the, you know, a great, you know, owner to somebody and being a resource to them, you know, my tenant said their water heater was out last, I think it was two weeks ago, last week. And I I switched an appointment around and I came back here. And, you know, obviously people are like, oh my gosh, you had to drive back to Buffalo. And I'm like, yeah, it's a 45 minute drive. You yeah. know, it's not, it's not that far. So I came back here and, it, you know, luckily it wasn't anything bad. We just had to flip a switch. And, but I was able to come back and see my tenants face to face and change the, you know, filters on the furnaces and, I'm sure they appreciated that. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I think that's the difference of the kind of service that you as a landlord can provide if you choose to, and that I think your tenants appreciate that. Um, and especially in this economy now where there's a lot of people that aren't putting money into renovating or improving or keeping their property mm-hmm. safe. So that separates you. Absolutely. And I got one of my friends who closes on his first investment property tomorrow, and it's a duplex in Buff Fountain. Hey, hey. <laughs> there's a theme here. Well, you know, do you mind sharing? So for a lot of people listening, they maybe have a professional job and they've, you know, 
th- thought about investing in real estate, but can you share a little bit about, if you feel comfortable, your deal metrics and has this, because you own this property now for two years, three years? About a year and a half. year and a half. Okay. year and a half. Do you feel, has it been a good deal for you? It has been a good deal. Um, yeah. It was a, talk about, yeah, it was $125,000 purchase. Mm-hmm. And, and here's what I always tell people, like Columbus markets, again, it's completely different, but it's similar. If I bought a, a duplex in Columbus, I would probably pay three hundred and fifty to four hundred and fifty thousand dollars, depending on where the unit's at. I would get pro- at the time I bought it, I wouldn't have had an inspection, or I would have had an inspection. I wouldn't have been to be able to get any remedies or anything or or any of that. So one hundred twenty five thousand dollars here in Bell Fountain. It was multiple offers. I got an inspection. I had a remedy period. After the inspection, I got a brand new roof and money for a a new furnace. Score. Wow. So I have a brand new roof. Already had one new furnace. So I got the second furnace replaced. So I have two new furnaces in it. And I'm getting $1,300 a month. Between the two units. Between the two units. My mortgage is just shy of $700. Yeah. It's cash flowing. It's cash flowing on. It day really one. was cash flowing day one. Yeah, First day property. one. Yeah, already had already had tenants, and here's the funny thing. So one of my tenants moved out just because of their their life circumstances changed. It wasn't because bad landlord or anything, or I didn't increase rent, and I was nervous because I was like, oh, now I got to get the unit cleaned. They still have the mortgage. What what's been broken? <laughs> now I got to find a new tenant. How yeah. do I screen them? They hadn't even moved out yet, and I had three people message me on Facebook, hey, I heard your unit's going to be available. And I'm like, how did these people even <laughs> find me? Like, like it was just so funny. And my friends in Columbus are like, are you serious? So came in. I had my um, cleaners, one of my past clients, so supporting her business, come go. down, and she cleaned the whole unit for me so I didn't have to touch it. Came down. I had to change the locks and change a f- other few minor things. Tenant moved in less than 30 days. And they're, and I did increase their rent fifty dollars, so that unit increased rent with the new tenant. Yeah, and they've been awesome. Love mm-hmm. hearing that. And again, I think it's hearing more of those stories of types of investment vehicles in real estate, like you mentioned, duplexes. Some people are buying and renovating and flipping single family homes. Some folks actually start to buy their first commercial property and do a renovation for a retail store or a restaurant or an office. And so in the whole sphere of this, there's a there's a whole different diversity of types of investments and assets that can be acquired, but it's all under that real estate investment umbrella. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I know this is just one property, but so it sounds like you didn't use a property management company, right? No. Okay. So that's on the residential side. Jason, do we use a property management company for our No, we, we, we had to create one. Tell me why. <laughs> well, I think it is the, the connection and, and it, there's also expense and a lot of small towns, the, the term property management company just doesn't exist. And so you know, we, Very interesting. yeah, I mean, we, we, we answer the phone. If there's a customer service issue, um, we have contractors that, mm-hmm. you know, are plumbers and electricians and, and have skills in carpentry and repair. Um, we depend on them. Yep. And, 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 you know, as you start to grow your portfolio, the management of those calls and of those inquiries, you know, increase. And, um, I think a lot of it is just developing good systems, practices, and processes to maintain your properties. I mean, Andrew mentioned filter changes for the longest time. We just ask in our lease agreement for the tenants to change the filters. I know in my own home, I mean well to change the filters, (laughs) but time flies by. And then, you know, then a tenant calls and says, Hey, my furnace isn't working uh-huh. and we go there to the property and I pull out the filter. <laughs> it's, <black. laughs> it's worse than that. I mean, the, it, it's in. So what we did to help tenants is that we incorporated the filter changes into our process and we build them a reasonable cost for doing that. And by sending our team member in, we can also, you know, ask them the question, Hey, how's everything else working at your property? They're also kind of walking through the space and they can identify if they see things that are concerning that need to be raised to the, you know, to, to the owner or need to be raised to the tenant. Yeah. That's actually a great tactic. And one of the reasons I was talking to one of my friends back in Columbus who owns some properties. And he said, you changing the filter is a great opportunity to get in the house to see what's going on. But also you get this be face to face with your tenant. 
and it creates that human element of, you know, not, I'm not just paying some random guy in Columbus. They know who I am. They see my face and it changes the whole aspect of, I think how they treat your property, how they pay you on time. And it just creates that it creates a different level of service, but also a different level of relationship between tenant and landlord. Yeah. It humanizes it. Yep. Agreed. It takes another, another level of intentionality from your end though. Right. For sure. But it makes a difference. But like Jason said, we answer the phone. That's another thing. There's not press one for this, press two for that. Yeah. Leave a voicemail. And I think it goes back to, you know, you said earlier, just showing up, you know, making yourself available. If there's an inquiry, a call, a lead, like there's so many people that just let, let it sit in the email inbox. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It sounds simple, but it makes a difference. There's one thing we have not touched on, and I want to dive into it, and that is that you are on a TV show now. <laughs> Tell I am me so about jealous. This. That's How incredible. Does this work? <laughs> yeah, so uh, my first episode is supposed to air December 10th. Um, it's called The American Dream TV Selling Columbus. It will also be on Apple TV, Amazon Prime, and Roku, and it All is right. a national Emmy-nominated show. That is in other markets. Um, in Columbus, I think there's 10 of us agents and we're, they want it to be 80% lifestyle, 20% real estate. So, which fits into kind of just who I am as an individual of, you know, going back to what Jason said about how I would, I like to highlight local businesses. That's all this show is, you know, I'm highlighting local businesses, sharing community and what that is around Columbus and the surrounding areas. And then throwing in a little real estate. So it's going to be a fun show. I've already recorded my first episode. It was in old Hilliard. So I highlighted crooked can brewing company. Nice. And then one of my uh, friends is uh, new, new builds in Hilliard. Love that. And I'm hearing that Hilliard's getting a lot of new things. Um, hearing some rumors on the street about a new winery maybe coming. There is. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Of course there was an <laughs> article in the Columbus dispatch recently. So <laughs> Yeah, no, uh, I mean, I'm not a big beer guy, but I'll drink wine. So. Yeah. <laughs> so it looks like Jason's going to be visiting Hilliard. <laughs> <Yeah>. Yes. <laughs> so what does that look like? The TV crew just shows up and uh, just follows you around? <laughs> yeah, well, so so we have to, and that's the other thing in, in kind of how this differentiates itself from like, a you know, what you see on TV and the HDTV where they kind of basically have full autonomy of what's going to happen on the episode. You have to film all day. You're filming multiple days. This is... I'm, I'm kind of, I'm the host, also executive producer, where I come up with the whole episode. I have to write it all down. I'm sending it to the producers. We have a pre-production call. We go over what I want to do and what my plan of attack is. Plan B. What if it rains on that day? You have to have a plan B. And then they approve it, which is, again, I've done one episode. So it was a really cool process to kind of go through that to see, man, like it's not, I don't just show up. I have to like plan this out and say, Hey, this is who I'm meeting with. This is what we're going to talk about. Here's my questions. I'm going to ask them. Mm -hmm. This is what I plan on showing. And then when we show it actually made it easier when I went to film. So we got the videographer, we showed up. My episode is four minutes and 25 seconds of a 30 minute show. And I think we filmed for six hours. Yeah. And they'll right. take and cut that to get the best content and clips that relates to the story that, that needs to be told. Absolutely. So then after I recorded, I had two days and then I had to get back in the system and then put everything in there. What are the three main points that you want to highlight to ensure that they're mm. on the show? And, and, you know, you have to give all their full names, their full titles, so then they can put everything on the screen. I've seen my episode and I'm super thrilled for everybody else to see it because I think it highlights, again, that community and it's, me highlighting another business and, and showing a house and sprinkling that in there. Mm -hmm. And and I really enjoy doing that. That's awesome. Content is everything. And we have learned this on the podcast. And this is a big credit to Ethan pushing me out of my comfort zone in the beginning <laughs> to say, you keep talking about doing this podcast. So you just need to do it. So today we are recording. This is episode 30 something, right? Um, I want to say 27. Okay. So we're not quite there yet, but almost <laughs> to 30 episodes. And here's what I've learned is that the amount of text and emails or people catching me on the street to say, I listened 
I watched, I learned this, and then all the guests, they share that content with their audience. So I think this is the power of how marketing is changing today is that we are, you know, we're, we're creating this content. If we do our job and make it yeah. valuable and interesting and insightful, other people will want to listen and then they'll incorporate those practices into their business. 100%. I've always thought of myself actually doing a podcast and not, not on real estate, just I want to, and now doing this, I'm like, this is fun. Do it. Yes. It's a good time. <laughs> we, you meet people. And I think what we've really enjoyed is storytelling how we got started, how the first project began. And then the people that were uh, in the original days, yeah. the OG, the OG, and then, and then how, you know, we build advisors and friends and hearing about their companies, their tips. I mean, that, that really is why we created this podcast and it's working. And rather than coming to their own conclusions about who Small Nation is or where they come from, you know, y you can find out for yourself or, you know, we don't have to take the time to explain, you know, an hour long story, you know, go check it out on the, on the podcast. So certainly been a joy for us. And, uh, you know, to those listening, thank you so much for, you know, being a part of this journey with us. Um, but yeah, good luck with your show, man. That sounds like a lot of fun. I'll I be hope, watching. I'm excited. I hope that. <laughs> and I want to see you with the you. Emmy up on the stage, <laughs> acceptance, acceptance speech. Get ready for that. So, <laughs> yeah. No. Um, all right, Jason, you have a kind of a summary or gold nugget for us here today. Well, there's a few today. I, I just want to say that the biggest one that I took away from Andrew is the importance of just showing up. Uh, I think that naturally. You know, he w was gifted in sales and building relationships. But I think the thing is, some people say it's like, that person's just lucky. It's not about <laughs> luck. It is about being the right place at the right time. But you've got to find what that right place is and you've got to show up. So that meant a lot to me. And I think that for the listeners, that's going to be um, be really important. And then the, the other thing is, is finding ways to be a resource and adding value. In every conversation... There are people that push business cards. There are people that look the part, and, and I, I've been to a lot of open houses. You know, they smile, they welcome you, and they say, I'm not going to bother you. And But then there are questions that come up. And, and I think it's, again, walking around and being that resource, but it takes practice and takes, you know, experience to share the knowledge of things to know. But that, even when you're young and inexperienced, that is going to be the, the, the game changer is how can you be a resource to someone and add that value. And then the other thing I think you mentioned, he used the word coach. Did you pick up on that? Yep. Is being willing to surround yourself with people that have had life experience that you have, that, that you have yet to experience, but you want to experience. Yeah. So I, I think it's always being investing in yourself. And I think this leads to where I'd like to hear from him is what are the books, the podcasts, the things that right now are filling you up? <laughs> no, I, I do. I do like what you say, show up. I mean, and that's a, that's a big thing for me is, is showing up, being open to being coached. And I think my biggest thing is what I, what I really have tried to change over the last couple of years or, or, or not change, just be more conscious of is, just surround yourself with good people. And I think at the end of the day, if, if you focus on showing up and surrounding yourself with good people, things are, things are going to be positive on, on all aspects of your life. Mm -hmm. Um, but one of the, one of the great books that kind of changed some of the things I've done in real estate was giftology. So I think you and I had this conversation. John Rulin is a personal friend of mine. Um, John I'm, and I'm I, jealous. It, we <laughs> met at a conference through a mutual friend before John even wrote his book. And I encourage everyone that is listening to check it out, this whole idea of giftology. And I know Andrew, Andrew practices it because right after he got his license, I show up at the front door at my house and keep in mind, I had not done business with him, mm -hmm. but I got this beautiful engraved wine and cheese board with my name on it. <laughs> nice. And, and again, I think it was, you, you tell me like, that's what you had learned. And, and I will tell you after that, I'm always thinking of Andrew, how can I refer leads and opportunities to him? Cause that, that meant so much to me. I appreciate that. <laughs> and there, and there's another book, um, the referral of a lifetime. All right. Unbelievable book. It's not real estate related, but 
I, I gift those two books out to people a lot. And I think there's just so much value. And I always tell people that I'm like, I hope you find as much value as I did in these books and you can use them outside of real estate and they can be very impactful for your life. So, yeah, I, I am much more apt to read a book if it's gifted to me from someone that, you know, I know and respect, like, it just because obviously there's intentional, right? Hundred percent. So because nobody does cool that. Nobody. Idea, no, yeah. Not many people gift books. Yeah. Cool. Um, last thing is, where can people find you, man? Where can people keep up with what's happening with you? Yeah. So, um, social media um, at Hirsch uh, on Instagram is H U R S S H H H. Um, you can find me on Facebook, or you can. Text me at 937-844-1431. All right. You're going to love, wow, you're gonna love what you're going to get. <laughs> <laughs> that is not a requirement of this podcast, but he went for it. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for tuning in and checking out the Small Nation podcast. You can find us anywhere that you listen to your podcast, including Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and even the Small Nation YouTube channel. I hope you're able to pull some value from that conversation, and we hope to see you in the next one. If you enjoyed it, be sure to leave a like, comment, or a five-star review to help more people to discover this podcast. Stay tuned to Small Nation on social media to keep up with all the cool projects happening here. And until next time, this is Ethan with the Small Nation Podcast signing off. Thanks, everybody.